There are still many questions, many answers that we are seeking. And with your help, and as long as you don't give up, I'm sure we will find out what the truth is. What really happened to Philip Marshall? Did he really kill his two children, kill the family dog, and then kill himself? As the Calaveras County Sheriff's Office has told us. That is the main question. And what do they base their findings on? How much evidence do they have? Where is their proof? Show me the proof. Well, there isn't any. Little to no proof. Little to no evidence. And the fact that the Calaveras County Sheriff's Office came to this conclusion so quickly should make everybody think twice. Is this just another day in paradise or is there more to it? We're going to be talking about that right now. I'm going to be reading a couple quotes from a chapter of my next book, False Flag Philip Marshall. This is something Philip Marshall has said. The official version about some ghost Osama bin Laden in some cave on the other side of the world defeating our entire military establishment on U.S. soil is absolutely preposterous. The true reason the attack was successful is because of an inside military stand down and a coordinated training operation that prepared the hijackers to fly heavy commercial airliners. We have dozens of FBI documents to prove that this flight training was conducted in California, Florida, and Arizona in the 18 months leading up to the attack of 911. That's from Philip Marshall himself. Philip Marshall understood that 9-11 was a false flag event. He wrote two non-fiction books about 9-11 and the lies surrounding it. But he also wrote a fictional book titled Lakefront Airport. According to his Facebook page, False Flag 9-11, in Lakefront Airport, quote, Marshall writes a contemporary historical fiction based on actual events, including his early flying experience at Lakefront Airport. His relationship with the CIA, Barry Seal, Pablo Escobar, and the notorious Medellin cocaine cartel. End quote. In his early life, Marshall was a contract pilot at Lakefront Airport in New Orleans, Louisiana. He was raised in New Orleans, the same city where on March 1, 1967, District Attorney Jim Garrison arrested Clay Shaw for conspiring to kill John F. Kennedy. As a pilot, Marshall was involved in many government operations. Then one day he decided to kill his two children, his dog, and then himself, without a motive and without a suicide note. Someone within the Calaveras County Sheriff's Office concludes that the deaths of Philip, Alex, and Michaela Marshall are the result of a double murder-suicide, immediately ruling out the possibility of a triple murder. The authorities' conclusion is reached within hours of finding the bodies in Murphy's, California. In the words of Han Solo, I've got a bad feeling about this. Another independent researcher looking into the false flag of 911 is dead. I got a chance to visit the small town where this alleged double murder suicide happened one week after the incident occurred. After visiting twice, it's clear to me that many in the small town of Murphy's have their doubts about Philip Marshall killing his two teenage children, his dog, and then himself. Murphy's is a small town full of local business owners, retired military personnel, wine connoisseurs, bikers, and of course, Freemasons and members of the Order of the Eastern Star. Surely in a small town like this, news travels fast. I knocked on the front door of the Masonic Hall, hoping to get a comment about the tragedy. I guess no one was home. There were three cars parked in the parking lot, though. Some type of church or temple was attached to the two-floor building where weekly meetings are held. I assume the people inside the hall know as much about the Philip Marshall case as I do, but assumptions are not facts, they're just unanswered questions. I was warned not to involve or question the Masons or the Order of the Eastern Star members in the Marshall murders, but when the spirit moves me to do something, I usually will. To be clear, I was not accusing the Masons or the Order of the Eastern Star of being involved in the murders, I just had a feeling. That if I ever did speak to the right Mason, I would get some answers about the Marshall deaths. There is a Masonic building in just about every city and town in America. It's their job to know what happens in their area. 
at least in my opinion it is. I have been told that I am wrong and no one knows anything about Philip Marsh. Okay. I took a walk down Main Street and got a chance to talk to some locals from the town. I was told that people in Murphy's were still in shock and trying to cope with what happened, but many had suspicions that Philip Marshall and his children were murdered. How did you know about Philip Marshall? I was asked. Oh, I write books similar to him, I responded. Be careful, someone from the town warned me. I asked, do you think he did it? There was a slight pause. While recognizing the many questions surrounding the case, this person found it easier to cope with the ordeal by thinking Marshall wouldn't do such a thing. This person also understood that there was something wrong with the official story of 911. The same person understood the risks Marshall was taking in challenging the official story. After I told this person that Marshall had basically expressed some concern for his safety, and we discussed a little bit about the World Trade Center, I got the general feeling that this person had the same doubts as me and many others. There were questions as to why no neighbors reported hearing any gunshots or any suspicious activities. It's possible no one communicated with Philip Marshall or his two children for two days before some of the teen's friends found Mr. Marshall lying in a pool of blood inside his house. I couldn't find Marshall's last two books, The Big Bamboozle or False Flag 911, in the local bookstore. More copies are on the way, I was assured. I realized I wasn't the only one asking for his books. I still have not found a copy of Lakefront Airport, but I know they exist somewhere. And of course, since the writing of that, I have found a copy of Lakefront Airport, and I have read it, and um, I did some videos on that too. Four years ago, Philip Marshall, under the username Flyer82, posted on the TruthMove.org forum about his first nonfiction book. False Flag 911. Marshall wrote, 1. My agenda as an airline pilot is to find the culprits in the attack against my fellow aviators. 2. To reopen hearings with witnesses under oath and to uncover FBI files and the blacked out portions about the Saudis in the congressional report. The official story. Philip Marshall allegedly shot his two teenage children, Alex Marshall, 17, and Michaela Marshall, 14, his dog, and then himself, inside his home in Murphy's, California, while his estranged wife was out of the country. The last time some friends heard from Alex or Michaela Marshall was on Thursday, January 31, 2013. On Saturday, February 2, 2013, at 3.10 p.m., concerned friends of the two teenagers called the Calaveras Sheriff's Office after knocking on the front door of the Marshall home. Through the front door window, they saw Philip Marshall lying face up on the floor, in a pool of blood. Deputies went to the residency on a suspicious circumstance welfare check. The two teenagers were allegedly found on the couch next to each other. They also found the dog deceased in the master bedroom. It seemed clear to me that Philip Marshall was associated with many black operations in the 1980s as a Learjet captain involving the Central Intelligence Agency. A former guest on Coast to Coast AM, Marshall's biography for that site states Marshall has researched 30 years of covert government activities, a revolving door of Wall Street tricksters, media moguls, and their well-funded politicians into every branch of our government. Post 9-11, Marshall has led a comprehensive 10-year study into the technical plan used by the 9-11 hijackers and is the leading aviator expert on the September 11th attack. The same bio also describes Marshall as a former government special activities contract pilot. The Santa Barbara Review's article on the alleged double murder-suicide stated, The veteran pilot confided that he was concerned about his 10-year independent 9-11 study and most recent book since they pointed to the Saudis and the Bush intelligence communities as the executioners of the attack that defeated all U.S. military defenses on September 11, 2001. Marshall said he knew his book might cause some people to take issue with him. The coroner in the Marshall case told reporters, It did appear as though Alex and Michaela were sleeping when the bodies were found. A forthcoming toxology report will show if Marshall or his two children were drugged. The story of Philip Marshall continues after his death. It should be easy to prove whether or not Marshall fired a gun that day. If he didn't, then perhaps he did not do what he is accused of, obviously. <laughs> if someone or a group of people suicided Philip Marshall or murdered his two children and dog, then I would call that a professional hit. 
While I have my doubts about the suicide and murders, I cannot prove that Marsha was suicided, nor can I conclusively say that he was guilty of a double murder-suicide based on the little evidence we have been given. The investigation into the alleged double murder-suicide begins with the assumption that there is no foul play. The investigation is built around this conspiracy theory. In The Big Bamboozle, Philip Marshall writes, As a former operative in the group's notorious covert missions, including Iran-Contra and the sting of Pablo Escobar, I recognize that this smoke rising over Manhattan might add a major piece to my large jigsaw puzzle of evidence. Philip Marshall's first wife, Anne Colooner, told the Union Democrat she did not believe Marshall was a contract pilot. She believes her former husband provided a taxi service for Barry Seal, a man who worked in black ops smuggling drugs in and out of the country for the CIA and DEA. So how much did Coloner really know about her ex-husband? In the same interview, she admits that Marshall was not always honest with her when it came to his travels with Barry Seal. He'd be in one city and tell me he was in another, she told the Union Democrat. Coloner, who lives in Louisiana, was also surprised at the allegation. I don't see him doing that without being in an altered state. Philip Marshall began flying at age 15. The young pilot's first flight instructor was his father. On 9-11, after the second plane struck the World Trade Center, Marshall's father called him from New Orleans, a city where Philip was raised. From his Santa Barbara home in Northern California, Marshall picked up the phone. Phil, thank God you're home, Marshall's father added. There's more planes missing. In Richard Clark's gatekeeping book, Against All Enemies, Clark wrote that on 9-11 there were more than a dozen planes missing that day. As Marshall watched the event of September 11th unfold, he began to make connections between the terrorist attack and the fictional book he was about to publish called Lakefront Airport. Even before 9-11, Marshall had a sick feeling that America was in deep trouble, that a group with this new Bush administration, just like the old Bush administration, was an incredibly dangerous, brazen bunch of well-connected, well-educated ideologists. They were on a power trip similar to others in world history, but as far as I knew, this was the first attempt by what our founders had labeled domestic enemies to overthrow the Constitution and place America under their own absolute power. Many news reports were quick to echo what the Calaveras County Sheriff's Department claimed. Philip Marshall killed his two teenage kids, his dog, and himself. What we know is that there is no motive for the allegation, and we know that this conclusion was made the same day that the three bodies were found. The family dog was found in the master bedroom. The two kids were found sleeping on a couch in the front room, six feet away from each other, and Marshall was found face up near the couch in a pool of blood with his gun next to him. The biggest conspiracy theory here is the one that the police have come up with. Calaveras County Coroner Kevin Raggio said the two teenagers, Alex and Michaela, appeared to be sleeping. Joel Metzger of CalaverasEnterprise.com pointed out it's highly unlikely Marshall could have shot one without waking the other. Metzger reported that Sergeant Chris Hewitt was asked about this. Hewitt responded by saying he could not comment on it. It's part of an active investigation. But I thought they had concluded their investigation when they determined that Marshall was guilty of a double murder suicide. Perhaps the investigation is still ongoing because the police have no motive, no suicide note, and no indication that Marshall fit the profile of someone who murdered the two closest people to him, his own flesh and blood. Some would say that Marshall did this because of the separation and future divorce of his second wife, Sean Marshall. That is a theory to which there is no evidence. Critics point to a December 2008 dispute Marshall had with Sean and her sister Erin over the custody battle of the kids. Philip Marshall was accused by Sean and Erin of slapping Erin at the Forest Meadows home. Marshall was detained, not arrested, and eventually released. A month earlier, in November, Philip Marshall hid in the shower of his house with a video camera as Sean entered the home and allegedly stole a bottle of six 20 milligram pills of Cadian, a very strong opiate. The police were called out and eventually arrested Sean Marshall, charging her with petty theft, trespassing, and possession of drugs without prescription. The charges were dropped on September 28, 2009. When asked by police why she took the pills, she told them she hid the pills in a tree and planned on giving them to her lawyer. A divorce hearing was scheduled for February 25, 2013, almost a month after the deaths. 
Sean Marshall filed for divorce on October 2012. Though the police have no motive, and it's possible they never will, there are theories that one of the reasons why Philip would kill his kids is over the divorce. Again, this makes little sense considering the age of the children. If Philip Marshall was as close with his kids as friends and neighbors claim, then he didn't have to worry about losing his teenage children in the custody battle. Alex was 17, almost an adult who could make his own decisions as to where he wanted to live and why. But Michaela was 14, I believe the judge would have asked her where she wanted to reside with the mother or father. And both the parents don't live that far from each other either. Since the two teens went to a high school near both Marshall residences and were active in both social and sporting activities, there's little doubt the teens would want to finish high school at Bret Hart Union High. Philip Marshall was heavily involved in the school activities as well. So for me, the if I can't have the kids, nobody can theory is weak. Very weak. Bob Friel, security guard at the gated community at Forest Meadows, told the Union Democrat, I would never have guessed anything like this. He describes the Marshalls as a normal family. Bret Hart Union High School's assistant principal, Kelly Osborne, is quoted as saying, It just doesn't make sense. A neighbor named Mike Brown described Mr. Marshall as a dedicated father, and Marita Calloway of the Calaveras County Board of Supervisors said Marshall was very involved with his kids. Joel Metzger of CalaverasEnterprises.com reports that Calloway also said, quote, the actions don't match the person we know, and, quote, he loves his children. Next door neighbor Carolyn Greenwood said, I knew him long enough to know he was a regular guy. He was a good father, always there for his kids and a helpful neighbor. Marita Calloway, who also lives in the gated community, Forest Meadows, told the sheriff's captain that she truly felt somebody came in the house. While visiting Murphy soon after the incident, Wayne Manson learned that a side door was open when the bodies were found. The same day the bodies were found, the police released a statement claiming the reason for this murder-suicide is unknown at this time. So where is the motive provided by the Calaveras County Sheriff's Office? They have none. The people who live near Philip Marshall and communicated with him have a hard time believing Marshall would kill his two children. There is no suicide note and no motive. Also, no one heard any gunshots between Thursday, January 31st and Saturday, February 2nd, 2013. On February 3rd, Sergeant Chris Hewitt made it clear that the police investigating the crime do not believe there was foul play. Quote, All evidence and information at the scene confirmed that this was indeed a double murder-suicide and there was no evidence to suggest there was an outside party who entered the house and committed a triple murder. I hope part of their evidence is gun residue found on Philip Marshall. Of course, the police can't even determine the time of death. They can only theorize on that, too. It happened sometime between Thursday and Saturday. The autopsy results by Calaveras County Coroner Kevin Raggio confirmed what we already knew, that all four died from a single gunshot wound to the head. The toxicology report, which would not be released for a few more weeks, was expected to shed some light on what really happened to Marshall and his family. Until then, I don't see how anyone could have concluded this was a double murder-suicide. I believe Marshall, his two kids, and the family dog were murdered one or two days before the Super Bowl, which happened to take place in Marshall's hometown of New Orleans. There is just as much evidence to suggest foul play as there is to suggest a double murder-suicide. Yes, Marshall had a Glock 9mm registered in his name, but where is the ballistic evidence to prove Marshall fired the weapon? Even then, how could police rule out foul play the same day the bodies were found? On February 19th, Wayne Manson told Alex Jones of Infowars.com, police said even before they had finished investigating the case, they permitted professional cleaners to come into the Marshall home to clean the premises. After that, there were two sets of vehicles seen at the Marshall home still conducting the investigation after the home was professionally clean. Madsen of the Wayne Madsen Report was in the town of Murphy's right around the same time I was. On February 13th, Sean Marshall and her sister were at Bret Hart Union High School near Murphy's for a special ceremony for the two slain teens. The sister, Erin, gave some type of eulogy and Sean gave the closing statement. It's not clear if either two women think Philip Marshall was guilty or innocent of this crime. Sean was quoted as saying by Joel Metzger, 
Being in Turkey and getting this news, it was almost unbearable. When I heard of this devastation, there are no words ever to explain the emotions, the hurt, the regrets. I couldn't hear God at that moment. I couldn't hear his answers. Why? Why would you do this? Why them? Why me? Hug everyone. Love everyone. Be kind. Well, why blame God? Why not blame the ones who murdered Philip Marshall and his two kids? Shall we just trust in what the police say? Should we believe without evidence that Philip Marshall murdered his two children, his dog, and then shot himself on the right side of his head? Wayne Madsen was in Murphy's the same day as the ceremony. That night, on February 13th, Madsen told InfoWars Nightly News host Jakari Jackson, quote, That evening, somebody tried to break in through a sliding door at the back of the residence. It's quite clear that Marshall had something that somebody wanted so bad they were willing to kill him and his children and his family dog for. Conspiracy theories continue due to the unanswered questions, not because of Marshall's past. Examining Marshall's past brings us to Barry Seal. Barry Seal's wife once said that her husband flew the getaway plane out of Dallas after John F. Kennedy was killed. It's believed that Seal began flying for black ops missions in the 50s and hired Marshall in the 80s after Seal lost his pilot's license. Marshall told Coast to Coast that many of the contract pilots did not know what their planes were carrying. Both Seal and Marshall were involved in smuggling arms and drugs into South America. Barry Seal had ties to David Ferry, who was also a pilot at one time. In 1967, David Ferry was questioned by District Attorney Jim Garrison about his involvement in the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Ferry lied to Garrison about his whereabouts on November 22, 1963. Soon after Ferry met with Garrison, Ferry allegedly committed suicide. On February 19, 1986, Barry Seal was shot multiple times while attempting to exit his car. Seal was going to testify that George H. W. Bush was involved in smuggling operations. Barry Seal may have been involved in what is known as Operation 40, the alleged hit team that was ordered to kill JFK on November 22, 1963. Philip Marshall's fictional book, Lakefront Airport, is about Barry Seal and his CIA-connected smuggling operations involving contract pilots. According to page 152 of Philip Marshall's last book, The Big Bamboozle, quote, Barry had some wild encounters with the world's most dangerous people. That included cocaine kingpins and intelligence community assassins. In Marshall's only fictional book, Lakefront Airport, he told the tales of Barry Seal's dealings and eventual sting on the notorious Pablo Escobar, as well as Mr. Seal's early days of smuggling marijuana and explosives and his dealings with Ollie North and George H.W. Bush's secret operations south of the border. On page 153 of The Big Bamboozle, Marshall refers to Barry Seal as his former boss. The third man from the left is my former boss, Barry Seal. This picture was taken in Mexico City on January 22, 1963, at the La Forma nightclub. Of the picture, Marshall writes, Here may very well be the founding members of the Intelligence Community Special Activities Division. This photo was taken ten months before President John F. Kennedy was gunned down in Dallas. Some independent investigators believe that this was the assassination team nicknamed Operation 40 that pulled it off. My trip to Murphy's. My friend Patrick Henningsen of 21stCenturyWire.com said Murphy's is probably the most picturesque town in Northern California. Well said. Wayne Madsen confirmed everything that I learned on my trip to Murphy's and so much more. If not for Wayne's excellent work, I might have reserved some judgment for a later date. It's clear to me that many people in the town of Murphy's do not believe the official story about Philip Marshall. I hope this revelation will help them consider that 9-11 was an inside job, as Marshall believed. He made direct ties between the hijackers, the flight training they received in the United States, and the Saudi Arabian government. It's believed the Saudis and others financed the terrorist operation that killed over 3,000 people, spawned two unconstitutional wars, created the Patriot Act, and made room for the NDAA legislation, where the president could detain anyone for working with terrorists whether they are citizens of the United States or not. Due process died on 9-11. Even worse, many believe due process died a long time ago. 
On February 19th, Alex Jones told the Infowars.com audience, I talked to Colonel Marshall of the Defense Language School. Different Marshall, by the way. He said, all I know is Mohammed Atta trained in my class. When Philip Marshall saw the second plane hit the World Trade Center, it would set him on a course to discover the truth about 9-11. He came to realize that the Osama bin Laden killing on May 2nd, 2011 was a farce. Philip Marshall was not killed because he wrote a book on 9-11. Many people have done that. Can we prove he was killed as part of a black op? Not at this time. Yet we know Marshall had dealings with black ops and that he knew a lot of key players in the Iran-Contra scandal and the sting of Pablo Escobar. One of the questions I have is how Marshall's children felt about their father's books. Apparently, on Michaela's Facebook page, there's a link to her father's books on 911. Finally, we have a tie-in to more gun control. This time, the high school where Alex and Michaela attended has created a bereavement fund that includes a scholarship for future students. One of the considerations for the scholarships is the student's view on gun control regulations in the community. This is a quote here. A bereavement fund for the siblings has been set up at the U.S. Bank branch in Angels Camp. Donations can be made out to Alex and Michaela and mailed to the bank at 580 South Main Street, Angels Camp, California, 95222. The donations will go towards the memorials and a student annual scholarship for Bret Hart High School. The funding will consider students who are involved with the promotion of mental health awareness and gun control regulations in the community, according to the organizers. Students were told instead of paying admission to that Friday school dance, they could donate to the bereavement fund. While I am happy there is a bereavement fund to honor the two teens and to help out other students, I am disgusted that the organizers would use such a tragic event to promote more gun regulations. With all the surrounding questions, what is the big picture here? What is the Big Bamboozle? Philip Marshall answers that in his book, The Big Bamboozle. Quote, the big picture was emerging as an empire with a confederacy of domestic enemies attempting a coup, a revolution against the United States. Phone interview with coroner Kevin Raggio by Chris Gordon. Chris Gordon, investigative researcher and We Are Change San Francisco member. The last facial expression is essential in determining the state of condition that the person was in when they died. Chris Gordon. Investigative researcher Chris Gordon from We Are Change San Francisco spoke to the coroner of Philip Marshall and his two teenage children. Chris Gordon called Calaveras County Coroner Kevin Raggio this Tuesday to ask some questions about the conspiracy theories surrounding the alleged double murder-suicide. To allege is to declare without proof, says John B. Wells, former host of Coast to Coast. The first question Chris asked the coroner was why the neighbors didn't hear any gunshots. There are five houses within a close vicinity of the Marshall home. A neighbor across the street said he heard two suspicious noises on Friday night. February 1st, 2013, one day before the bodies of Philip, Alex, and Michaela Marshall were found. The Marshall House sits on a ridge top facing the Stanislaus River Canyon. Mr. Raggio pointed out there's a lot of driveway in front of the house, which is about 30 or 40 feet off the road of Sandalwood Drive. In response to why neighbors didn't hear any gunshots, Raggio told Chris, You have to walk past the garage to get into the house. The house is all double-pane windows. So with the doors closed, you've got a big garage there, number one. That's going to insulate the sound. You've got a big, substantial front door on the house. All dual-pane windows. You're not going to hear much. Sergeant Chris Hewitt of the Calaveras County Sheriff's Office came to a similar conclusion, where he was quoted as saying, The houses are not very close together, and if they are well-built and insulated with all the windows and doors closed, the shots would have been muffled. The coroner told Chris that gunshots, quote, would probably be more louder towards the front of the house. In the front of the house, there's nothing in front of them but a remote river canyon and probably nobody for 20 miles. Raggio also mentioned the neighbor across the street from the Marshall home who heard two suspicious noises on Friday night. There was a neighbor that did hear something strange that night, Raggio told Chris. The neighbor across the street heard something that got his attention. 
but him being in his house and the shots going off inside the Marshall home, you probably wouldn't notice. The neighbor, Jeff Woods, heard something strange twice in the same night, but didn't specify if the noises sounded like gunshots. According to Joel Metzger's article, Woods was in a downstairs room with the television on in the background when I heard an unusual noise. I stopped working and went upstairs, turned the lights on, and looked around. I didn't hear anything else, so I went back downstairs. Not long after that, I heard another strange noise. I muted the television and listened for a second without hearing anything else. When Chris Gordon asked Mr. Raggio if he thought Wood's comments had any credence, Raggio responded, Yeah, why wouldn't it? Exactly what type of strange noises did Mr. Woods hear? The last facial expression is going to be marked on your face, says Chris Gordon. Chris Gordon then steered the conversation towards the two teenagers. Both Alex and Michaela were found on a U-shaped couch, a couch that was most likely removed from the home on Super Bowl Sunday, apparently sleeping. Chris asked why the gunshots did not wake up one of the children. That I don't know. That I don't know at this point. That's something I'd like to think that they didn't hear. I don't know if they did or didn't. The first one probably didn't hear anything because I suspect they were probably asleep. So maybe one of them did hear. I don't know. The last facial expression is essential in determining the state of condition that the person was in when they died. Raggio echoed what police have been saying. As far as I know, there was no silencer of any kind. Kristen wondered how one of the two would not wake up to the sound of a gunshot that was a few feet away from their ears. Do you find that suspicious at all? No. Chris clarified the question. You don't find it suspicious that a gunshot wouldn't wake up a child? Well, not. I don't. In looking at the scene, I mean, yeah, it's mysterious in my mind, but I don't find it suspicious. As far as, it makes me wonder, you know? Like I said, it's mysterious. It makes me wonder, you know, if one of them heard anything. But do I find it suspicious? I don't find it suspicious. I don't suspect that from what I can see. It is what, what they, you know, what we determined it was. You know, murder-suicide. Who is they? Or did the coroner simply misspeak before he corrected himself in saying we determined the cause of death? How many people does it take to determine the cause of death? From my understanding, only the coroner determines this. Not they or we. We could have meant the assistant coroner. The next question was if there was a suicide note found at the crime scene. The coroner responded, not to my knowledge, no. My job is to determine the cause of death. I don't deal with the criminal aspect of the whole thing. The autopsy determined that all Philip Marshall, Alex Marshall, and Michaela Marshall, and the family dog died from a single gunshot wound to the head. Raggio confirmed it's his job to determine the cause of death. Is it possible someone was helping him decide what happened here? At this point, I don't know. Mr. Raggio believed this was a double murder-suicide. It appears to be what it is. Chris then asked about the evidence for the double murder-suicide since there was no suicide note. Well, one thing I can tell you, and then you'll probably have to get the rest from the sheriff's office, but when you shoot yourself, you're standing up. There's a considerable amount of blood splatter that goes in every direction. The blood splatter, unless somebody was floating, they would have, in my mind, had to have tracked in the blood splatter. Marsha was standing up when he allegedly shot himself? So from your determination, it seemed like Marsha was standing up when he shot himself, Chris asked. Probably, yeah. Kevin Raggio doesn't believe a foreign country like Saudi Arabia staged the deaths to appear as a double murder-suicide. I've heard all these conspiracy theories and all this other stuff. In my mind, if you're a foreign country, for instance, and you're coming after Philip Marshall, you'd send somebody in. I'm Italian, so I'd send for the boys in Sicily. They'd come in and, you know, you know what I mean? It'd be like Sopranos. The boy from Italy would come, and he doesn't give a damn if it looks like a murder-suicide or not. They're going to put bullets in your head, and they're going to leave. That's going to be it. But in this case, why would you go out of your way to stage it as a murder-suicide? According to a Santa Barbara View exclusive, Philip Marshall expressed concern for his life, but he wasn't worried about a foreign country. He was more concerned about people inside the United States. And here's a quote from the Santa Barbara View. 
During the editing and pre-marketing process of Marshall's book, he expressed some degree of paranoia because the nonfiction work accused the George W. Bush administration of being in cahoots with the Saudi intelligence community in training the hijackers who died in the planes used in the attacks. Chris Gordon thanked Mr. Raggio for his time and for answering the questions to the best of his ability. I'm not an expert, Raggio told him. I just happen to be the guy who was the coroner there. He said the Calaveras County Sheriff's Office is doing a very thorough investigation in light of the conspiracy theory and so forth. I know they've gone, taken some extra steps, and you'd have to ask them to elaborate on that. That's about all I can tell you. Chris Gordon has assured me he's going to keep asking questions about the strange anomalies in this case. Chris is not satisfied with the official story given to the public. Neither am I. How about you? In the near future, we will try to find out more about these extra steps the authorities have taken. Chris Gordon noticed the autopsy report can be purchased for $10. He asked Raggio, is it possible that we could purchase an autopsy report for Philip Marshall? I think you could, probably, eventually, yeah. It's not available as of yet? Not yet, no. Do you have an idea of when it will be? At this point, no. Chris Gordon has worked at five different mortuaries. He's seen a lot of dead bodies up close. He says part of the answer to this case could be found on the facial expressions of the deceased. It would be very easy to determine if one of the kids were woken up by the gunshot going off six feet away by their facial expression, Chris told me. It's easy to tell if someone was sleeping when they died, their eyes would be closed. That was probably how they were able to determine so quickly that the children were sleeping. If they appeared to be sleeping, they probably were found with their eyes closed. But what if someone just changed the facial expressions after killing the four family members, I asked. I'm a mortician, Chris told me. I make people's shocked and traumatic faces look like they're sleeping. It's a process. But surely a professional or professionals could have manipulated their faces to make it look as if they were sleeping, right? If it was done, it would leave a trail. You'd be able to determine that, he told me. One month later. One month after the alleged double murder suicide, there was no clear motive for the allegations against Philip Marshall. I became impatient waiting for the toxicology reports. Chris Gordon explained to me, in cases like this, where there's a suspicious death, the coroner has to remove the vital organs, take samples, and then send them off to a lab to determine whether or not there were drugs in the system of the deceased. As we waited for the toxicology reports, we still didn't know if the police could prove Philip Marshall fired a weapon in the final days of his life. A ballistic test would quickly determine if Philip Marshall fired his 9mm Glock pistol sometime between January 31st and February 2nd when the bodies were found. The coroner believed Marshall was standing up when he shot himself. Marshall was found in a pool of blood, lying face up. If Marshall shot himself, then fell to the ground, he would have head wounds to help prove that. But the body has since been cremated. Here's a quote from Philip Marshall's book, False Flag 911. Even if I'd had no other reason to investigate, my airline family deserved an honest account of the attack. I might add that we also deserve this because 9-11 has been used against us ever since, in a running nightmare of contrived bankruptcy, draconian working conditions, and hostile management. Last Media Release Police promised that the latest media release would put to rest conspiracy theories about a triple murder in the Marshall case. We waited almost two months for their evidence to be released to the public. Evidence that included the coroner's autopsy results, the toxicology report, and hopefully paraffin and ballistics tests. Also, people wanted a motive for the theory that Philip Marshall shot his two children, the family dog, and then himself. Sergeant Chris Hewitt confirmed there was no suicide note found at the residence. So the question is how did the police come to the conclusion that Philip Marshall was guilty of a double murder suicide? Here's a quote from Philip Marshall on Coast to Coast. There's definitely a movement going on. It seems like they're planning for something. They're definitely hooking into the counties, local police departments. It's going to be one big federal eye watching us when we should be watching them. It's Philip Marshall, Coast to Coast AM. 
Investigative researcher Chris Gordon and the host of Hard Talk, Walter Bradley, traveled with me back to Murphy's, California, exactly one month after my first trip to the small town. Our mission was to give the people a closer view of the Marshall home and see how far apart the neighbors' houses are. We learned of a 5K run in honor of Alex and Michaela Marshall on Sunday, March 24, 2013. We spoke to locals in the area. Most of them did not want to talk to us, but a few would. We visited the Marshall house and saw a car in the driveway, one box outside the front door, a vase with two flowers in it, writing on the front door and a few empty rooms. We saw freshwater puddles in front of the house and a hose wrapped around the front porch railing. Philip Marshall's silver Volvo was still parked in the driveway. Chris Gordon and Walter Bradley knocked on the front door, but no one answered. Here's some of my notes that I took. A small white porcelain frog sits in front of the front door. On the white door, someone wrote, Love wins inside of a big heart. Looking through the front window, you can see all the way to the back porch. A long hallway with hard glass floors leads to a living room where a black couch faces the back porch. A glass table and black chairs are near the couch and it's possible some things were removed from this room. Cleaning items were also visible through a nearby window. Behind the living room is the kitchen area. Some of the bedrooms are probably on the level below, and at least one room on this level, the highest level, was empty, except for one white blanket on the floor. The neighbor, where Wayne Manson took the first photograph of the Marshall House, did not answer the door either. Comparing Manson's photograph to what the three of us saw, not much has changed between the time Manson was there and when we arrived almost a month later. The barbecue pit and the porch wing had not moved since the photo was taken in early February by Wayne Matson. There were two versions of the media release sent out by the Calaveras County Sheriff's Office on Super Bowl Sunday, February 2nd. A third release was supposed to be available sometime around March 22nd, according to what Sergeant Chris Hewitt of the Sheriff's Office told Chris Gordon over the phone. The new media release should include a toxicology report. We hope tests have been done to determine if Philip Marshall fired a weapon before he died. More answers will be found in the police report and testimony of what the friends of Alex and Michaela saw when they went to the Marshall home on February 2, 2013. From the media release above, we know the eyewitnesses saw Philip Marshall lying in a pool of blood. I would also like to know if the eyewitnesses saw Alex and Michaela sleeping on the couch as well. The first two media releases describe how the police found the Marshall children, but not if the eyewitnesses saw the Marshall children. Independent researcher Dan Hennon found a blog about three family members who went to the Marshall home on February 14th, one day after Wayne Madsen witnessed someone breaking into the Marshall home. Hennon found this information. Two family members and a friend of Marshall's estranged wife reportedly entered the home and rifled through drawers and boxes of papers in the garage in search of something. Forest Meadows Homeowners Association President David Turner was alerted to their presence and told them they had no permission to enter the premises. Turner also remarked that they were, quote, making quite a mess. According to a neighbor, the estranged in-laws claimed they were looking for bills that had to be paid. On March 20th, Dan posted in the Facebook group, Justice for Philip, Alex, and Michaela Marshall. I was able to get through to David Turner today. He was a president of the association for three years and is now the treasurer. I asked him if he could clarify a little further into what happened that day when he had to tell the family members they didn't have permission to be in the home. He responded with, I'm not interested in getting into that. Now the coroner told Chris Gordon that Philip Marshall shot himself while standing up, quote, most likely. Would that mean Philip Marshall shot himself while standing up and somehow the gun fell under him as his body hit the ground? Because one report claimed the gun was found underneath Marshall. If Marshall was standing up, then the coroner should find some wounds from the impact when Marshall hit the hardwood floor after shooting himself. An employee at a local business told us that Marshall was right-handed and grabbed stuff off of the shelf with his right hand, too. This person saw Mr. Marshall sign his credit card receipt with his right hand. We asked for the video that showed which hand Marshall signed with, but the employee said they only keep surveillance videos for 30 days. The space between the Marshall house and the neighbor's house is important as well. 
Calaveras County Coroner Kevin Raggio told Chris Gordon, quote, you have to walk past the garage to get into the house. The house is all double pane windows, so with the door closed, you've got a big garage there, number one. That's going to insulate the sound. You've got a big substantial front door on the house, all dual pane windows. You're not going to hear much. I agree that the houses are not very close. There is a long driveway that leads down to the Marshall home. If anyone heard the gunshots, it should be the neighbor next door, the house to the right of the satellite image of Marshall's house. When we arrived to the area, the home next to the Marshall residence was for sale with the sale pending sign. I'm not sure how long the house has been on the market, but it could have been before or after the tragedy on Sandalwood Drive. The writing on the door is the creepiest thing I saw on my trip back to Murphy's. A few people have mentioned that I may be making too much of someone writing Love Wins on Philip Marshall's front door. But what do you think? Did Love win? I think as long as we keep searching for the truth, Love wins. If we ignore the questions that surround the Philip Marshall case, I don't see how Love wins. Wayne Madsen told Alex Jones of Infowars.com that Philip Marshall was estranged from his wife, but it was very amicable. The two trips to Turkey are interesting. Though the Marshall's first divorce hearing was set for February 25th, the couple had recently traveled to the country together. Interviewed by Jakari Jackson on Infowars Nightly News, Madsen spoke about Sean Marshall's relationship with her husband. The estranged wife was actually in Turkey, Madsen tells Jakari Jackson, on a trip that Phil Marshall arranged because he was trying to set her up in an import business to import linens and soaps, especially soaps and saffron from Turkey. Her background was in buying such things once for Nordstrom department store. So it wasn't that it was an acrimonious divorce. They were very friendly. He was trying to set her up in business so she'd have something to do. Okay, I'm going to read Philip Marshall's obituary. Philip R. Marshall, Philip Randall Marshall, 54, died tragically along with his son, Alex, 17, and daughter, Michaela, 14, at their home in Murphy's, California on February 1, 2013. Phil was born in New Orleans on August 2, 1958, the son of Carl Marshall of Covington, Louisiana, and the late Catherine Olson Marshall. He is survived by his father, his brother Robert C. Marshall, and his sister Virginia Marshall Morgan and their families. A memorial service will be held at 3 p.m. on Friday, March 29th at the Lakefront Gazebo in Mandeville, Louisiana. Phil spent his early years in the New Orleans area. He was a graduate of Mandeville High School on the North Shore, where he was an all-star receiver. He briefly attended Southwestern University at Lafayette and worked offshore before pursuing his passion, flying. Phil worked his way up from a student pilot to instructor, then to charter pilot on Lear Jets until he was hired by a major airline. He progressed to become a full captain on jumbo jets, flying around the world for United Airlines. Phil lived in Dallas, Miami, Chicago, San Francisco, Lake Tahoe, Santa Barbara, and Murphy's, California. He was a devoted father to his children and spent many hours on the ball field as a little league coach. He was a lifelong diehard Saints fan, attending games as a kid, starting from John Gilliam's opening day kickoff return for a touchdown, through the Billy Kilmer, Archie Manning, Saints, and, and Drew Brees days, and culminating with the thrill of the Super Bowl victory in 2010. Phil even organized and flew the free Sean Payton plane last summer and fall. Phil authored three books that he self-published, and he definitely was not afraid to tackle extremely controversial subjects. That was published in the Times-Picayune from March 15th to March 17th, 2013. Sergeant Chris Hewitt's third press release on the Marshall investigation became available on March 29, 2013. The release was designed to shed light on the evidence against Philip Marshall, who is accused by the Calaveras County Sheriff's Department of a double murder-suicide. Allegedly, Marshall shot his two teenage children once in the head, shot the family dog in a bedroom, then shot himself on the right side of the head near the front door with the gun upside down. The police claimed the gun was upside down when Marshall shot himself, where they said, quote, The Glock handgun was sent to the California Department of Justice Crime Lab for fingerprint analysis and is scheduled for DNA and ballistics examination, result pending on the DNA and ballistics. 
the fingerprint analysis positively identifies Philip Marshall's fingerprints on the interior plastic carton of the ammunition box and the gun magazine. In regards to prints on the gun, the Department of Justice lab analysts explained, the only usable friction ridge impressions remaining in this case were two patent impressions appearing on the Glock 19 handgun. These patent impressions were visible on the slide area of the handgun upon the initial examination. The patent impressions lack sufficient quality and quantity of friction ridge detail for identification purposes, but are usable for elimination purposes. Subject Philip Randall Marshall could not be eliminated as the source of these two patent impressions due to similarities in ridge flow and ridge characteristics in agreement with his left thumb and left index finger. So the lab analyst for the California Department of Justice specifically mentions Philip's left thumb and left index finger. All they say is that they cannot rule out Philip Marshall from being the person who used that gun. Once again, they have no proof that he used it. All they can do is say that we cannot rule him out. So, that's a lot of trickery right there. Then they explain how a man could shoot himself with a gun pointed upside down. The investigators also claim it's normal for people to shoot themselves this way, where they're quoted, The inverted upside down positioning of the handgun is a natural body arm posture of someone shooting themselves and is consistent with him having shot himself. The media release further states that Philip Marshall suffered a point blank gunshot wound to the right side of his head. Investigators determined the firearm was being held upside down as indicated by the muzzle impression found on Philip's head. The blood spatter and a lack of displacement or disruption found at the scene proved to investigators that no other persons were in close enough proximity to have shot Philip Marshall. I strongly believe that the Calaveras County Sheriff Gary Kuntz should make a public statement about the lack of evidence against Philip Marshall. Without a motive, a coroner's report, or paraffin test, Philip Marshall was accused of shooting his two children and the family dog before turning the gun on himself. So here's my question to you, Mr. Kuntz. Does it concern you that your officers came to the conclusion that Philip Marshall was guilty of a double murder-suicide within hours of finding the bodies inside the Marshall residence? That should concern every parent on this planet, okay? Pinal Air Park. Did Philip Marshall reveal something he wasn't supposed to? Pinal Air Park is a known CIA front, but Marshall also revealed that he still had connections in the spook world that provided him information. It's possible Pinal Air Park was where some of the 9-11 hijackers trained for their suicide mission. It's also possible that Marshall had information that would prove that the hijackers were trained at this air park, but it's not certain. What is certain is he was working on a fourth book, and I'm sure somewhere out there, someone either has a copy or has read it. Possibly Senator Bob Graham. I have some connections that remain in the spook world, Philip Marshall told John B. Wells on Coast to Coast AM in 2012. There's a lot of contractors out there. Blackwater is one of them. There's quite a few other operators. So I was getting information from... It's a pretty tight circle. Aviation's a pretty tight circle in itself, but this particular strain of pilot we keep in touch. Let's just put it that way. And I started getting hints of this Pinal Air Base from about three guys that worked in that field. I have to be very careful about that because they still provide information to me. Philip Marshall went to visit the air park sometime between 2006 and 2007. He told John B. Wells, there's this airport out in the middle of nowhere. It's a triangular airport that has three runways on it and there's about a hundred airliners there in a the storage right now. Now certain people at Pinal Air Park told Marshall that many times people try to take pictures of that airport and they'll send a car out there and confiscate the camera and all kinds of bad activities. Well you can visit the Big Bamboozle Facebook page to see the photos Mr. Marshall took on his trip to Pinal Air Park. Marshall told John B. Wells that Pinal Air Park is a quote Long-time CIA-operated airport. There's a lot of controversy about trying to shut it down years ago. People that are on the board of directors are CIA people, so it has a long connection. All the way back to Air America. Philip Marshall 911. 
no clear evidence against him. The Calaveras County Sheriff's Office prepared a six-page statement on the Marshall investigation and released it on March 29, 2012. Sheriff Gary Kuntz and Sean Marshall Plummer, mother of the two deceased children, reviewed the third media release prepared by Sergeant Chris Hewitt before it was given to the public. When officers arrived at the Marshall home, they found Philip Marshall lying face up with a close range gunshot wound on the right side of his head. The police claimed the gun was inverted upside down. Marshall was found face up near the couch where his deceased children appeared to be sleeping under blankets on a U-shaped sectional couch. The gun was found with a bullet in the chamber with an empty magazine. In Marshall's bedroom closet, police found a 50-round box of ammunition with 43 unused bullets. Three expended casings were found in the living room near Marshall and his children. One expended casing was found in the master bedroom near the dog. A fifth unexpended bullet was found on the laundry room floor. So six spent bullets are accounted for with one round missing from the 50 round box of ammunition. The box of ammo was found on a shelf on top of an open safe. Outside the safe where they found the box of the ammunition, they also found a wedding ring resting on top of the box. According to the new media release by the Calaveras County Sheriff's Department, there were no signs of forced entry into the Marshall home. All the doors were closed, but some were unlocked. Quote, it did not appear that the house or any of the furniture had been ransacked. Police are relying on directional blood spatter to help prove their allegations against Philip Marshall. Blood cast off from his head was found on and around his body. Many people might find it strange that the Glock 9mm handgun was found underneath Marshall, because they are quoted as saying, Marshall was found lying on his back in the living room behind a sectional couch. The gun was located under his right side midsection. Now the muzzle impression left on Philip Marshall's skin helped determine the proximity of the gun to Marshall's head and the angle of the muzzle. Based on how they found the gun impression on Marshall's head and the quote lack of voids and blood disruptions, end quote, investigators concluded that no disruptions or voids were found in the high and low velocity blood spatter patterns. And this proves to them that there was no fourth person involved in this incident. Let me repeat that. Based on how they found the gun impression on Marshall's head and the lack of voids and blood disruptions, investigators concluded no disruptions or voids were found in the high or low velocity blood spatter patterns. And this proves to them that there was no fourth person involved in this incident. Apparently, Marshall held the gun upside down. The only fingerprints lab analysts found were of Marshall's left thumb and index finger, located on the slide of the gun, also known as racking the slide. This only proves Marshall cocked the gun. They could not positively identify Marshall's fingerprints on the trigger of the Glock 9mm. The Weapon the Fielchi Glock 9mm handgun is the alleged weapon used by Philip Marshall. In October 2011, Marshall purchased the Glock 9mm handgun from a gun store in Turlock, California. The gun was registered to him. On January 27, 2013, Marshall was videotaped purchasing ammunition from a Big Five sporting goods store in Sonora, California. Police believe Marshall was wearing the same clothing on January 27 as he was when found on February 2, 2013. He paid cash for the ammunition and police found a receipt for the purchase inside of Marshall's car. This is the same car three independent investigators saw in front of Philip Marshall's home on March 9, 2013. The Calaveras County Sheriff's Department believes Philip Marshall's gun was upside down when he shot himself on the right side of the head. Philip Marshall suffered a point-blank gunshot wound to the right side of his head. Investigators determined the firearm was being held upside down as indicated by the muzzle impression found on Philip's head. The blood spatter and a lack of displacement or disruption found at the scene proved to investigators that no other person were in close enough proximity to have shot Philip Marshall. The department also mentions that ballistics tests are still forthcoming according to the latest media release where they say, the Glock handgun was sent to the California Department of Justice Crime Lab 
for fingerprint analysis and is scheduled for DNA and ballistics examination, results pending on the DNA and ballistics. The fingerprint analysis positively identifies Marshall's fingerprints on the interior plastic carton of the ammunition box and the gun magazine. The placement of the patent impressions is very important. They are visible on the slide area. Subject Philip Randall Marshall could not be eliminated as the source of these two patent impressions due to similarities in ridge flow and ridge characteristics in agreement with his left thumb and left index finger. The report specifically mentions Marshall's left thumb and left index finger, but they tell us Marshall shot himself on the right side. Hmm. Now here comes the lack of evidence. There is no sufficient quality and quantity of friction detail for identification purposes. In other words, they cannot positively state that Philip Marshall's fingerprints were found on the weapon. Except for the left thumb and left index finger, there's proof he cocked the gun, but no proof he shot it. Ballistics tests are still forthcoming along with the DNA examination. As of today, the Department of Justice results and possible conclusions are still pending. This is more reason to prove a quick and incomplete conclusion presented by the Calaveras County Sheriff's Department. The investigators determined it was possible for the children to be shot within two seconds, within a few feet from each other, without one of them waking up. They also believe that four gunshots would be muffled inside the house, and that's why neighbors didn't report hearing any gunfire. The closest neighbors live about 50 feet away from the Marshall residence. Police performed tests inside Philip Marshall's house to see if one neighbor would be able to hear gunfire from next door. The unidentified neighbor did hear gunshots, but didn't think the noise would be loud enough to wake him if sleeping. The neighbor went on to say that despite the fact that the neighbor is a very light sleeper, the neighbor would not have been awakened by the noise. Nothing is mentioned about the suspicious noise one neighbor heard. According to one of Joel Metzger's articles on the Marshall case, quote, The neighbor, Jeff Woods, heard something strange twice in the same night, but didn't specify if the noise sounded like gunshots. End quote. Now Woods was in a downstairs room with the television on in the background when I heard an unusual noise. I stopped working and went upstairs, turned the lights on, and looked around. I didn't hear anything else, so I went back downstairs. Not too long after that, I heard another strange noise. I muted the television and listened for a second without hearing anything else. Philip Marshall was last seen on January 31st. Alex's last documented communication was by instant messaging on January 31st at 10.40 p.m. Michaela's last documented communication via cellular phone was on January 31st at 10.10 10 p.m. She took a cell phone self-portrait at 10.55 p.m. On page one of the six-page media release, the police go into details about the sister of Philip Marshall's wife, Sean Aaron Chamberlain's allegations against Philip Marshall during late 2008 and early 2009. How this relates to the incident that happened about three years later is unclear to me. Most of the incidents reported are from Aaron, not Sean Marshall. The bias against Philip Marshall is clear, as the police do not even mention Philip Marshall's incident a month before the alleged physical altercation in 2008-2009 with Aaron Chamberlain. In that incident, Mr. Marshall tried to have Sean arrested for breaking into his home at Forest Meadows. Marshall accused Sean of stealing Cadian pills from the house. Here's a quote. In 2008, Philip Marshall hid in the shower of his house with a video camera as Sean entered the home and allegedly stole a bottle of six 20 milligram pills of Cadian, a very strong opiate. Now, it was right around this time that all of the other allegations against Philip Marshall were reported to police. Why was there no mention of this incident in the third media release? While there was an extensive detailed account of the allegations against Philip Marshall, in fact, in the entire list of police involvement during late 2008 and early 2009, there is only one mention of Sean Marshall re reporting anything. In fact, in the entire list of police involvement during late 2008 and early 2009, there is only one mention of Sean Marshall reporting anything. 
December 7, 2008, Sean Marshall reported that Philip violated the emergency protection order. After reading the 12 reports mentioned, I'm left with a strange feeling that the police are trying to mold a motive out of circumstantial hearsay. Do they have the evidence to convict Philip Marshall of a double murder-suicide in a court of law? The answer is no. From January 2009 to February 2, 2013, when police arrive and find the deceased, there appears to be no further police involvement with the Marshall family. January 2nd, 2009, there's a civil standby is requested by Philip to pick up Alex from Sean. He requested that deputy call Sean and tell her to turn the kids over without a problem. So what was so special about 2008 and 2009? As police report, Sean Marshall initiated divorce proceedings against Philip Marshall in 2008. She withdrew the request in 2009. In October of 2012, she reinstituted the divorce process, at which time Philip Marshall moved back to his house in Forest Meadows. There was a divorce hearing set for February 25, 2013. Debt Kill The police explained Marshall's financial situation based on documents they found on the kitchen counter. Here's what they say. These documents included a list of financial debts he owed, dated 2-01-13 and totaled $67,000, as well as child support related documents and information. Doesn't say much. Marshall wrote in a spiral notebook, Debt Kill. Wayne Madsen reported that Marshall's house payments were up to date and the police do not mention any issue with the Internal Revenue Service. But they do say that a handwritten note was found inside of a spiral binder noting the debt amount and a handwritten comment stating debt kill. Authorities confiscated a laptop and a desktop computer and sent them to the high tech task force in Sacramento for forensic analysis. The results are still pending. The police said the computers, described as a desktop and a laptop, were seized by detectives during the search of the home and sent to the law enforcement high tech task force in Sacramento for forensic analysis. The results of the analysis are pending. So it's possible the police removed the bloody couch from the house to perform some type of tests in a crime lab, but they never state if they removed anything from the Marshall residence. The police returned to the scene of the crime recently to recreate how Alex and Michaela were killed. This leads us back to the mysterious cleaning crew that Wayne Madsen talked about. Madsen reported that a local professional cleaning service was at the Marshall House on Super Bowl Sunday, February 3rd, and spent a couple of days cleaning the Marshall residence, which was also a crime scene at the time. I suppose the only motive the police have is that Philip Marshall was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. They believe Marshall suffered from some kind of mental illness and point to his prescription narcotic pain medication as evidence. Here's what they say. According to records obtained, Marshall was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Additionally, the report stated that he suffered periods of depression and mania, which led to his dismissal or grounding as a pilot in September of 2006. Detectives also shared some information about Philip Marshall's medical records, where they said his medical records suggest that he also suffered from some sort of mental illness, drug dependency, anxiety, and depression. He was prescribed antidepressant medications for his mental health. During mid-year 2012 through January 2013, he frequented the medical clinic seeking additional pain medications. The media release states that Philip Marshall was under the care of a doctor for several years and speculates on mental health issues Marshall allegedly had. Yet this was not enough evidence for police to come up with a clear motive for the allegations of a double murder-suicide. It's unclear if the detectives talked to Marshall's doctor, but they did consult a different doctor about what might happen if Marshall combined antidepressants with prescribed narcotics. The police even sourced the FDA's research 
for the sudden outburst that led to the alleged double murder suicide. The Food and Drug Administration, which has not been friendly towards natural medicines, agrees that changes in psychotropic medications could result in suicide, hostility, or psychosis. This hasn't stopped the approval of psychotropic medications, of course. So here is the final conclusion of the investigators in charge of solving this crime. Yet in my opinion, from the beginning of this case, investigators have only sought to prove their theory, not to find the truth. Here's what they say. There was no evidence to support a theory that anyone else could have committed this crime, or that any other persons were present at the time of the shootings. Michaela and Alex Marshall both appeared to be sleeping at the time they were shot, indicating no signs of a struggle with a possible intruder. There was no evidence of a struggle with Philip Marshall and no signs of forced entry into the home. Various items of value were still present inside the home and no evidence of any additional weapons was found. Lastly, there was no evidence that Philip Marshall or his children were moved or repositioned after the shooting, which would also indicate an altered crime scene. Based on the final findings of the investigators, evidence shows that Philip Marshall and not an outside fourth person shot and killed Michaela, Alex, and the family dog, and then himself. To conclude, it is determined that this case was a double murder-suicide. Wow. Based on what? There's plenty of evidence to suspect that a fourth party was involved, in my opinion. This is mainly due to the lack of evidence against Philip Marshall. If the police cannot conclusively prove their own theory, why should they rule out all other theories? No matter how crazy those theories may sound to investigators, it is their responsibility to find the truth and bring justice to this tragedy. It is not their job to assume within hours that Marshall is guilty of a double murder-suicide and then search for evidence to prove their theory, which is based on circumstantial evidence with no clear motive. Ballistics tests and DNA tests are expected shortly, but don't count on it, because it doesn't seem to matter for those who have concluded Philip Marshall is guilty of a double murder-suicide. Am I the only one who believes the authorities are ignoring the possibilities of foul play? I doubt it, and I know for a fact I'm not. We will have to ask Sheriff Gary Coons for an interview to explain the actions of his officers. To secure the interview, we may need a resident living in Calaveras County, California, or one of the family members of Philip Marshall. Their reasons for ruling out foul play are very weak. Police cannot prove that Marshall fired the Glock 9mm and the only fingerprints they have of Marshall do not conclusively prove anything. Where they say Marshall shot himself on the right side with his left hand, the gun inverted, it makes no sense. The tests only conclude that Philip Marshall could not be ruled out as the one who shot the gun. This does not mean he fired the gun. The fingerprints found on the gun were not on the trigger, but on the slider, which is used to cock the gun. A bullet was found in the chamber of the Glock, but the magazine was empty. The police finding no evidence of a struggle or forced entry does not mean Philip Marshall is guilty of murdering his two children. The police have already admitted that more than one door of the house was unlocked. So there is little need to look for forced entry when you already have established a means of entry without force. Isn't it possible a fourth party simply walked in through one of the unlocked doors? Video of the Marshall House shows how many doors there are in the two to three story home. There are quite a few. The ridiculous prepared media release by Sergeant Chris Hewitt concludes by stating they base their entire theory of a double murder-suicide on the final findings of the investigators. Well, the final findings match the initial findings and their conclusions within hours of arriving at the Marshall House. If the purpose of this lengthy media release by Sergeant Chris Hewitt was to put conspiracy theories to rest, then in my opinion, you have failed, sir. Perhaps you should wait until ballistics test results are in your hands before you conclude anything. Do you seriously believe you could convict Philip Marshall of a double murder-suicide in a court of law based on the evidence in the possession of your department?
I challenge you to do so. I believe a jury will find Philip Marshall innocent based on your lack of evidence. As always, the truth resides in the court of public opinion. The bigger false flag may be due to Philip Marshall's stance on 911. He believed it was possible for the World Trade Center to be demolished by the impact of a jetliner and jet fuel. I do not. Marshall also believed this was a Bush-Saudi operation. I believe the 9-11 conspiracy goes much further. Regardless of our differing views on 9-11, that shouldn't stop me or you from investigating the death of someone who understood 9-11 was an inside job. I can never count the lies that I told, the times that I stole, told another bigger lie, won't be coming home tonight, many people run away to see if you care, to see if you were telling truth, said you'd always be there, or truth is like a dime, maybe mine it and find it, watch the sun shine, it's a gift of the blind, it greed that lives inside of me, inside of my dream, it's a rock without a value, the value of kings, I could be anything, but all I wanna be is me, liberty, democracy, republic, now we're living free, the bad economy, pays for the bombing, but we don't got no money for the homeless on our streets, and money is an object to make me an object, I'm part of the problem, or I'm part of the process, people losing hope when I look in the face they don't want to do the dope but it's harder to change something's wrong so we write a new song to try to lift the people up and show them love is a bomb who's got a ladder for the peace to ignite us and if we want to find the truth stop by looking inside of us and plus don't give up on me People gonna pay the rent when a dollar ain't a dollar isn't worth two cents. Two jobs is to cover the bills, part time, half time for the minimum skills. Low wage, low income in, it's a tenth of the month and you can't pay rent. Third job for the broke and poor, prices going up more than ever before. They make cuts, but they start at the bottom. Looking for a bonus at the top, they got them. House in the hills, a million dollar bill, the kills are free will, call it making a deal. Bugs in the phones, a world full of drones and cameras in the bathroom and all of your homes. Global occupation replacing the nation, people on the front line trying to save them. And plus, don't give up on me. Everything.